Uh, my name is Mike Holden. I used to be staff member in his department. I came as a student here in 1963. And they still can't get rid of me. So. Um, can we close the door in case the secret leaks out? <laughs> this is a very difficult talk to give. I've been wor worrying about how to give it for, for months. I tried it a few years ago and it went down like a lead brick. <laughs> um, and it's all driven by the work of Peter Rowlands that lets you think in completely different and new ways. So I'm going to do it in an old fashioned way, retro way, because what you're going to find is there's lots of difficult ideas that need to be up ahead of, uh, in front of you and then you have to pull them all together. If you did it in PowerPoint, where the PowerPoint slide disappears, it rapidly becomes completely intelligible rubbish, um, which is probably it is anyway. <laughs> what worries me is that I've made some fundamental stupid mistake, which I haven't spotted. If anybody spots it, put their hand up, please. Let me know. I'm going to start with where we think we are now as regards the understanding of the universe, which is... Um, called the Lambda CDMR model. It's uh, cold dark matter is believed to be an absolutely fundamental constituent of the universe needed to initiate galaxy formation in the early days and things like that. And the feeling is that dark matter is a particle, some sort of particle left over from the Big Bang. Does everybody agree with that statement? No. <laughs> you know, absolute rubbish. Right. <laughs> then, um, but uh, they, they, they built this beautiful Lambda CDM model, and they put it here on the diagram, which tries to explain uh, one of the, the key observables in, in cosmology is, is the redshift parameter, Z. And we live in the era, era Z equals naught. But then as you go back towards the Big Bang, Z increases till at the Big Bang, which is in the past, which is 13.8 billion years ago, the Z parameter goes to infinity, so everything gets infinitely redshifted. And going along here, we've got redshift numbers, like, and it's highly nonlinear. Most people do this on a log graph, they don't like log graphs. <laughs> so there's, uh, if we go back five to, to Z equals five, that corresponds to 13 billion years ago. So this is a non-linear scale. From here to here is 13 billion years. And from, from here, from, from about here to here is 0.8 of a billion years. So this, um, and this divided into two regions. The first region is around about Z of a thousand, which is the recombination era. And this is when the universe suddenly became transparent. When um, the, all the, 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 the uh, electrons combined with the, the, the nuclei, the helium nuclei and the, the, the remaining protons to form a transparent gas and suddenly all the uh, light started propagating across the universe and we see that now as the cosmological background. So the temperature fluctuations are essentially imprinted on this surface um, at the recombination era. But before that, around about Z of 3391, was the end of the radiation-dominated era. Now, in this, in this era, era here, the temperature is so high that the radiation, the enormous energy density, and the staggering pressures generated by radiation, because everything goes as T to the fourth, remember, um, completely dominated the dynamics of the universe. And what matter was present didn't matter, what didn't, didn't affect the dynamics at all. So this is the radiation dominated era, and it lasted about 9,000 years. And then, after you come out of the radiation dominated era, you've got a region where there was all sorts of acoustic activity and sound waves traveling through the plasma and stuff like this. And then that goes on for about another 300,000 years. And then you get the recombination, the universe suddenly becomes transparent, um, and we then go on right down now to the mod to, to the modern day. Now, based on the observations of the microwave background and all this beautiful stuff, the people fitted this as 
the proportion of different materials. So 4% only of the universe is, is baryonic matter, stuff we know about. Famously, after the first three minutes, you just had helium nuclei, about 25% mass of helium nuclei, 75% hydrogen. Neither of those decay, and you're not making any more. So the, the proportion of baryons just stays constant, around about 4%, from, from the very early Big Bang right up to the present day. Similarly, they fitted dark matter. Dark matter, if you believe it's a particle made during the Big Bang, then you're not making any more. It's clearly lived for a very long time, so it doesn't decay very fast. So it's staying around here, and their fitted value is around about 28%. But the other thing we, we all know around about 1998 was that the, the universe was observed to be accelerating. A staggeringly unexpected uh, experimental observation. And immediately people said, oh God, this means you must have dark energy. That the vacuum has got its, its own energy and it acting as a sort of gravity repulsion. And this is what's accelerating the distant universe. And so you put all this into your model, and you find then that the, the total um, energy content of the universe, 4%, 4 plus 28% plus 68 gives you 100%. Okay? And just for completeness, what we're going to use, we're going to need later on, is the Hubble parameter. The Hubble, the, the Hubble it's not a constant, it varies with Z. But here, in, in, today, then H is around about 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec. But it's very nice to actually put that in SI units. And that's 2.2 times 10 to the minus 18 per second. <laughs> all right? People don't often see it written in that form. Nice. But it's handy to have that. All right? But then when you get back to Z equals 5, the expansion was going a bit faster. And you now find that H is 4697 kilometers per second per second per megaparsec, which means that number's gone up 1.6 times 10 to the minus 16 per second. Okay? But that, you see, that's mostly the history of the universe. It's only 13 billion years. Uh, it, it's changed a bit, but it hasn't changed all that dramatically. But as, as you go back, of course, into this era, then H starts the, the Hubble parameter gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until at the Big Bang it's infinite. So that's where we are. Now the question is, dare we think otherwise? <laughs> and if you think otherwise, why didn't this model, why didn't the fit see anything? How many people think we ought to try and think otherwise? About half of them. <laughs> 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 no other method. No other. No other way. Would have that proportion. Yeah. Right. So. <laughs> so, <laughs> driven by what Peter's been doing for years, I, I, I've, I had this thought in my head which I can't get rid of, um, and I don't quite know what to think of it. So, I will present what I think might be going on. And what I'm going to do like that this is there's lots of abstract ideas which all have to be out there. We then have to pull them together and see where we go. And the first thing I want to talk about is this acceleration, this observed acceleration, which gives us the reason for having dark energy. Dark energy at 68%. The history of this, as far as Peter Mullen is concerned, is rather interesting. Let's first of all start very do something which is just no more than an exercise. We take the Hubble formula, differentiate it with respect to time, okay, that the dot there means uh, d by dt, it's Newton's old notation, which is still nice to use. And that says that the acceleration is h squared times r. Okay? Now the interesting thing about that is Peter Rowland has derived that expression before 1994, when nobody else, as far as I know, was talking about acceleration, but he didn't derive it in a trivial way. It was a 
deeply derived thing based on thoughts of Max principle, inertia, instantaneous gravity flow, how you see things in a rent thing. And he wrote, he wrote a little book. He wrote it, yeah, it, it took a whole book to explain. But you first wrote that equation down, that there was an acceleration term like that before it was observed. That's true, isn't it? That's true, yeah. Okay. So oh, in 1998, one. they discovered that in fact the distant universe was accelerating. That was completely unexpected. No one, as far as I know, predicted it. And this, of course, really set off the fire. This was proof that dark energy had to exist, and Nobel Prizes followed. Great. <laughs> then, then we get this in 2013, this observation, with particularly with the dark energy <coughs> term coming down. It, so it used to be around about 74%, but now the fit, as the data got better and better, come down to 68%. And then, is 68.3% plus or minus some little error bars. Forget about those. Now, Peter Rowlands then asks a very interesting question. Is this term here actually equal to two thirds? Is it special? And he wrote a paper which I think a lot of people don't know about, which they should do. And I've got some copies here. So, okay. So, and see as the man is here, would you like to briefly say about this piece? Yeah. <laughs> Can I just have a copy from him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was I saying? <laughs> well, you can follow it from the paper if I tell you. Because otherwise I'd have to go off the... Yeah, no, you just tell it. Just, just, just use the words. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you go on the first page, that's the... Uh, that's the standard expression for the equation there's the standard expression for Hubble redshift. Okay? And what you got here is um, if you take that as two thirds, let's go on to the third page, and you've got rho vac over rho pret equals two thirds. So the vacuum value, the va this value is two thirds of the critical value the value to get absolute flat space and all that sort of thing. And if you if you uh, write that write that down in in the formula, the formula using the formula for vacuum density, you get rho vac equals h naught squared over four pi g. If it's if it's uh, critical, and if you put that equation into what you get from general relativity or any of those things. <coughs> you will get um, that series of equations below. And finally, you'll get to the next page, and you'll get a force, the, the fourth page, if you turn to the fourth page, the equation at the top is the force, the two forces that come out of that equation. And the first one is gravity, and the second one is this force, and you see that this force per unit mass is h naught squared r, which is the acceleration. Yeah. So, so if you've got two thirds, if you've got actually exactly two thirds, you get h naught squared r. That's using purely conventional physics. That's not using any original um, information. Okay? That's right, Peter. Purely conventional physics. So, essentially, then, what Peter pointed out in that little paper, which you ought to know about, is this, this expression here, the acceleration, h squared r, has got some fundamental meaning. Right? Um, and it's interesting again to notice in SI units, um, h is 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 18, but so that means that h squared is 5 times 10 to the minus 36. So in SI units, to get significant acceleration, you need staggering distances. So you don't see it as a nearby phenomenon. You staggering distances, bigger, bigger than 10 to the 36 meters, which is much bigger than the physical universe. So this is an interesting equation. If it's fundamental, it's got this term in it, which, as we will see, will, will, will become important. So, that's the first thing. 
So let's, so we we'll need, we we'll need to keep that in mind. Now, I need to talk a bit more about Peter's work, which is, and I'll tell you what, it's really nice to use an expensive computer a uh, screen like this to hang paper on. <laughs> right. Peter's idea is based on two things. First of all, that the totality of everything in the universe, the entire universe, is absolutely nothing. There is nothing at all in the universe, not even abstract. Uh, zero totality and how does it get away with that trick essentially everything in the universe can be split into dual systems and the dual systems actually cancel each other out but if you're sitting inside the system you see something you see something and as well you have to treat the universe as a totally entangled quantum system all right? it, is, it is totally entangled one system like this. And if you think about it what, it, what it means is that if you make a change in the universe, then the universe responds to preserve zero totality. And that's what we call law of physics. All right? You change something, the universe responds in exactly the same way every time. Laws of physics, preserving zero totality. Okay? Um, and the other thing is, he, he wrote down a completely new formalism in quantum mechanics based on nilpotent ideas. Nilpotent being an object which, when you square it, gives zero. So it's a repeat operation giving zero, basically. And an example of zero totality in cosmology is this very famous thing. That, suppose you've got a huge region of space containing lots and lots of matter with the mass inside MR, and this is here then a galaxy on the surface moving away with a velocity v, which is given by the Hubble law, that the negative gravitational potential energy at that point there is exactly balanced by the kinetic energy of the outgoing galaxy. Okay, so that, that negative plus that gives you zero. And this, from this, we get our expression for the critical density. So the critical density is that density which essentially makes this true. And it must always be true. That's the assumption we're going to make, is that it's an example of the zero totality. Now the other thing in, in, in Peter's work is his no potent quantum mechanics. And He's written books on this, so it's just easy, not easy to talk about it if you don't know about it. Basically, you can describe a fermion in terms of a nilpotent structure, which looks like this, where these things here are quaternions. He builds in a quaternion algebra into, into this system in a very beautiful way. But the duality is this, that if you have absolutely nothing, and you make a fermion. What you've left is something else. You've changed nothing. So the totality of this plus what you've left behind must be, must cancel each other out. The totality of the universe is that. And what he shows is that you can write this vacuum, this, this, is, this is the vacuum system, you can write that in using nilpotence in actually three different ways. You can write down three different vacuum associated with this. And the duality is that this is the space we live in, but there is another dual space with it in which the axes are mass, time, and charge, whereas in this one, uh, the axes are space. And so the complicated idea is that the the four key parameters which you need to understand the universe, space, time, mass, which means mass energy, and charge, which means all the different sorts of, of charges available. Those are the only four parameters we seem to need to describe the entire universe. And they can form a dual system, a dual system 
which are in fact linked. Uh, the thing there are two three-dimensional spaces, and they're actually linked through the singularity, which is which is the fundamental paradigm. Now, this is an incredibly complicated and subtle idea, and if you've never heard of it before, I can imagine you're getting lost already. Okay, and but the crucial thing for us is that he made a prediction 15 years ago, at least 15 years ago that the nilpotent vacuum structures in here actually do the job of supersymmetry. There's been a great need for supersymmetric particles, par particles to do sort of uh, loop cancellations. It's all very complicated stuff. But people have been expecting to discover huge amounts of, of, of supersymmetry particles for every particle we know about. We'd spin a half, you're going to find another one, we'd spin one. This has been the reason, one of the reasons for building the LHC. Peter, 15 years ago, at least 15 years ago, said, that's not going to happen. You are not going to find supersymmetry. There are structures in the vacuum which do the job for you. Now, I gave a talk in this very room 14 years ago, and I said that, and the roars of disapproval. <laughs> and uh, you've got two minutes left. <laughs> so nobody believed it. Because the, the expectation was once you turn on the NHC, supersymmetry would be all over the floor, be plenty of it, you know, and be loads and loads of new physics around about one TV. Everybody was on about that. And to date, absolutely nothing. So Peter's prediction, made in the teeth of fierce opposition, is still winning. Okay, there's another 15 years of work to do with the NHC yet, and they're, they're, they're really looking hard. No, they don't think they're going to get it anymore. They don't think they're going to get it. No, Andy and people like that don't think they're going to get it anymore. Well, there you are, there. see, so something's changed. So the question is, if they don't get it, they need the loop cancellations done. How do they do it? Well, you've offered an explanation. It's but, been quoted in a review. But they're not beating a path to your door. No, no, they're not. So, so I, I'm this very interested, though. Yeah, he's no, I, probably yeah, the best man in this department. So here we are. The opposite faction showing this man. Structures do the job of supersymmetry. So, what can we carry on still thinking a bit more? Now, the Higgs discovery in 2012 was a very important thing. What was discovered in 2012 was a Higgs-like object with a mass of about 125 times the mass of a proton. But since then, there's a lot of experimental work being done on the data. And you can see two things. It is not only like the Higgs, it actually is spin zero, which the Higgs should be, and crucially, the couplings to particles depend on the mass. The bigger the mass of the particles it, it interacts with, the bigger the couplings. And that is now experimental determined. Okay? So the coupling goes as the mass. And that's exactly what the Higgs mechanism demanded. So I think today, so we can now believe that the Higgs mechanism actually works. And Peter, you're happy that the Higgs mechanism is what gives mass to your nil pole totally, totally happy with it. Yeah. Sorry? I'm yeah. totally happy you're with totally it. You're totally happy with it. So, so Peter gives you a thumb of proof. So Peter likes the Higgs mechanism. <laughs> so yeah. We can now believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> totally right. So, what we've got here is vacuum structures that do the job of supersymmetry. Okay, so proposal. The Higgs mechanism could give mass to nil potent vacuum structures. And just interact with it. Right, <clears throat> let's go back and look at this. So we're saying here we have a load of matter governed by this zero totality condition. I'm now proposing that we can we can make the Higgs mechanism somehow interact and produce a little blob of dark matter there, somewhere. How could we do that 
if we want to preserve zero totality. If you're going to increase that, you're making this more negative. So what you have to do to balance the equation, if you're making that more negative, you've got to make that more positive. You have to accelerate distant matter. So to preserve zero totality, this must also involve acceleration. So this term here, if you're going to believe it, an example of zero totality, if you increase this mass because you make some dark matter in here, you've got to accelerate this amount to the compensate. Crazy idea. <laughs> so. <coughs> so the idea is that perhaps it's just quantum mechanics. Perhaps we're now, non-locality in quantum mechanics is very important. Perhaps something like this is happening. If we make a lump of dark matter here, and then we, we accelerate two bits of matter opposite and opposite directions, you could just do one, but it'd be nice to do a pair, it's a three-body interaction, then you can create cold dark matter, this doesn't have to be moving, and you're balancing everything. That you've increased the gravitational, you've made the gravitational potential of this more negative, but you've balanced it by just doing an acceleration. Now it's not a continuous acceleration, it's just a jump. It's just a, a little speed up as you make your dark matter, and then it carries on expanding as you do, but just, just a little bit faster. And so we can take our equation here, which is that one, and just rewrite it. We read it like this, and then the, what we're going to do is say, okay, we're going to allow the mass to increase. But if we allow the mass to increase, this has to balance. So let's take the time derivative. Basically, we can say the time derivative of both sides must, must, must remain equal. So on this side, we can put d by dt, which we can write as d by dm times n dot. And on this side, we can write d by dt as d by dv times v dot. And so we end up with this equation here. Now, m dot could be anything. V is given by the Hubble law. What should we do about that? Does the accelerate, can the acceleration be anything? Or are we going to put something in there? seems to be fundamental. So let's put it in. And so this here has to be, M dot here is the time rate of change of dark matter. It can't be the time rate of change of the baryon because we know we don't make any particles. They always remain the same. So the only thing you've got in here is the time rate of change of dark matter. We can put in the whole relation for there and we can guess that we're going to put in a squared r over there and we fiddle around a bit and you end up with a rather strange little equation which might possibly be doing it's the fractional rate of change of dark matter with time and it says m dot over m is equal to 2h per second. Now, what's it mean? Remember h is 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 18, so 2h is 4.4 .4 times 10 to the minus 18 per second. What it means, I think, is that if dark matter is being created, that it's being created the rate of one part in 10 to the 18, which is very small. Now think of it like this. 
Supposing you've got a distribution of matter like that that contains 10 million galaxies like the Milky Way. The Milky Way has got about 10 to 11 stars. So 10 million Milky Ways <coughs> is about 10 to the 18 stars. So this says that producing a few stellar mass equivalents spread over 10 million galaxies each the side of the Milky Way. It's very, very tiny. All right? Very difficult to observe directly. You wouldn't see it. It was just hidden. So, essentially, that's the crazy idea. That's the crazy idea that we can give mass to these little potent structures that Peter's postulated actually solved the problem of supersymmetry, which then leads on if, we're, if, we, if we actually believe that it could be a non-local quantum process, gives you this prediction for the rate of change, the fractional rate of change of, of the dark matter with time. And it's interesting now to see how it fits on this, on this picture here. Because what we're saying is that the dark matter, which we've assumed to be constant, is not constant. It's actually growing all the time, given by that equation over there. So what we need is to make the assumption that actually this is true. This is true for all z. Right? Because it's the same, the same basic idea, zero totality. So it must be true at any stage like this. So this is the rate of change with z. We can put that, we can make that as a function of z, and then see how this plays out on this diagram over here. Mike, is what you're saying that we have something like a continuous creation of dark matter theory here? Well, it's not a continuous creation of continuous, it's a manufacturing of it because there is acceleration in the universe. So it's I a think. continuous balancing of dark matter with gravitational negative potential energy. Exactly. Right. It's this, it's, this, it's this thing here is Peter's zero totality. So the fact that we are changing the gravitational potential energy, yeah. well, wait a minute, shouldn't it be going down the gravitational potential energy? It gets more negative. It gets more negative. Okay, so the mass has to get more positive. Yes. So we're talking about local creation here right now between my fingers yeah. due to some motion of the expanding. Well, whatever. The, 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 the quantum system says it, it's just a total non-local non quantum system, non which would appear yeah. as non-local conservation of energy. That is true. It would appear locally as that. Locally, locally but true. globally, it's yeah. all right. Good. Okay? Lovely. And it's happening today at a rate which I think is just far too small to observe directly. Okay, good man. Okay. Okay? Good. So that's the idea. So good. let's now take this equation here and see what we can do with it as a function of z. Uh, so for this, I think we need a, another piece of paper. And I've got a, this is where I'd like to show my perhaps diagram. There's a, there's a table here. There's a visualizer over there. Sorry? Oh, yeah, okay. There, there is, um, yeah, there, if we could start the computer and just to put that picture up, it'd be great. Well, awesome. you pass these on for people, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So essentially, this, this is the way in which the Hubble parameter uh, varies in, in terms of the standard, uh, the standard way of, of analyzing this stuff. Um, this is the um, normalized dark energy term, which is the 68%, okay, 68.5%. This is the curvature term, and one of the discoveries was that there's no curvature term. Essentially, the, 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 the wider universe is just completely flat, so K equals normal, so we can ignore that term there. This is the term which scales. This is matter plus dark matter, and that's assumed to be a constant. But what we're going to say is that that's not quite true. The baryonic matter stays constant, but the dark matter changes with time. But we haven't put that in here, so this equation is only approximately true. And then this is the term which goes as t to the f as the fourth power. This is the radiation term. And that starts to dominate when Z gets very big. Okay, so in, when you're in this region back here, where Z is now up in the thousands and tens of thousands, that term completely dominates the whole dynamics. Okay. So if we can now perhaps just slide up and so we can look at the table. <coughs> And we're going to use this table to, to guide our thinking on the thing. So here is the Z parameter down here. And I've just taken a few values like coming up now. At this point here, the dark energy density is equal to the matter energy. And then we're going back to Z equals 5. And here is the cosmic ray background, the, the recombination thing, where uh, Z is 1,000. And the end of the radiation dominated era is this. And alongside it, I've put the, um, the, Hubble, the Hubble constant in SI units and in the more traditional way of showing it in kilometers per second or mega, mega parsec. Okay? So as we go back in Z like this, this slowly, you can see it slowly increasing until we get right back to Z equals 5, and then it's up, it's up near the near 5,000. So, the, the, the Z parameter back here is, um, is much bigger and in terms of the SI units it's gone from 2 times 10 to the minus 18 up to uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 16. But the other thing about this is, is the, the cosmic time, how many giga years. And this is highly nonlinear. So this is the time in giga years. So when you back to Z equals 1, that's nearly 8, 8 billion years ago. When you're back to z equals 5, you're back to 13 point, around about 13. So this whole period here, from here to here, is, covers most of the history of the universe. Okay, and you can see that the Hubble parameter here is round about, for most of it, 10 to the minus 18, so it's getting, getting a bit bigger. So if we look at, this little formula, it says that over most of the history of the universe, the, the rate of production of dark matter is actually being quite small. But where it starts to get very big, where at one part in 10 to the 10, and, or one, one part in 10 to the 10, around 1,000, and the radiation is one part in 10 to the 8. What it seems to be telling you, I can't do the integration, but essentially it's telling you that in, in the radiation dominated era, where the Z is so big, there's a huge rapid increase in dark, energy, in dark matter production, which is essentially hidden. Because the radiation dominates the dynamics. And it doesn't matter what you're creating in here, the radiation monitor. And so when you come out of the, this era up here and get to about there, around the cosmic wave, I think the amount of dark matter, a lot of it has been made, but then going from here to here, it's round, I think, around about a factor of two increase, just playing around with it. So, I think what this is telling you, if you can believe this, is that 
most of the dark matter creation occurs here. Then when we come out, we've got some sort of gentle increase, which possibly goes up something like this. And if you get the data behaving like that, but you feed it a model which can't see that, then perhaps what you're getting, this line here, is just the average. Perhaps there's a bit more dark matter in the universe, possibly in the form of black holes or things like this. But basically, that is testable. If you can persuade the guys who wrote this code to modify their code, to put this in, they can test it. And one of the things, one of the areas that could be interesting is here. In this, um, in this region where there's a lot of acoustic behavior going on. Because you, you probably know there are, there are today, there are two different values for the Hubble constant which disagree with each other. There's one looking out from the Earth, and the latest value says that the Hubble constant is about 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. But if you fit the physics of what's going on here, the acoustic the sound waves is called it's called the sound horizon. If you fit the data all here, you find you get a value of 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And these two disagree. And I think that the current opinion is this is important. It's not random. It's telling you something very important. And if you think about this region, this is a region where, according to this picture, you've stopped making, you've made lots of dark matter which has come up here, and now you're slowly making it as you go along with here like this. So in this region, the amount of dark matter is not 28%, it's less. It could be about a factor of a So, a few weeks ago, I sent an email to the, the guys who did this paper and said, would you like to run your model? Making the dark matter contribution only half of what you've got now. Complete dead silence. <laughs> because that is an impossible thought. You cannot think that thought if you think that dark matter is a, is a particle to be left over from the Big Bang. <laughs> you know, so, oh my God, it's a, another crank. <laughs> <laughs> so, the idea is testable and hopefully it can get completely destroyed. But at least it's testable if they're prepared to do the test. Um, so basically, that went a bit faster than I thought. That, that's where we are. That's the, that's the idea. <laughs> wow, what a tour de force, good for you. Well, that's, that's, it's, that's lovely. it's a very hard talk. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't seem to have much trouble with it though. You must be well, it's taken me three months to think about it. But I think this way of laying it out, yeah. did you find this way of doing it helpful? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he created an art installation as well as giving a fantastic... Well, I mean, we can keep that for all time now. I've just, been, I've, just been, I've just been asking for more pieces of white paper, but apparently they've not got any use of all. Well, you, you, you only get white paper if you do a photocopy or something. It comes out automatically. Right. We pay for every piece of paper. Yeah. I've got a precious one here. I'm going to use it. You can have a few sheets of this. Oh, no, it's okay. I've got this as well. I mean, it's okay. <laughs> Well, that's the way they do it. They, you pay for every sheet of... say about the, the chaps who were doing that um, simulation before? Yeah. You're asking about the dark matter. Is that software um, open source? Is that somewhere that is... Well, I don't know. This is the thing. The, 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 w -Bank, the, the Planck collaboration is a vast collection. Hundreds of institutes have all contributed to, to building this code. It's a very sophisticated code, apparently. It allows for lensing of the, of, of the, of the cosmic microwave background by the dark matter. So it's not a trivial piece of code. It's an incredibly subtle and, and really wonderful piece of code. And I think probably the only way to get people to play this is to find 
a friendly academic and say, would you let your students play around with this idea so they can kill it off? Do it as a student project. Do it as a student project. <laughs> <laughs> would it not be the case that galaxies in the past then would have spun more slowly than they are now? Well, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if you're right because I think I think the amount of dark matter being produced after this initial stage is rather small and spread over everywhere. So I don't know. I mean, and I don't know in what form the dark matter would appear. What form My do you think it does take? Sorry. What form do you think it is? Well. To be absolutely honest, one of the big outstanding problems in, in cosmology, as I understand it, is that when the universe became transparent, and you look back in a whole deep field, you can see galaxies already formed. All right, and the big problem: how the hell did they form so early on? Well, one of the ways you might be able to do it is if in this region here. You, you had a huge amount of black hole production where you're, you're stuffing dark matter down its throat and not normal matter. So perhaps you could have, um, in, in this very early area, although you're getting a huge amount of dark matter production, it's actually going to produce condensed objects, black holes and things like that, that are there um, for, for when for when the, the galaxies start forming. So essentially, the black holes came first, and they're a component of dark matter. So black holes and condensed objects are a component of dark matter, as well as the clouds of stuff which you see floating around the galaxies. All right, but I don't know. It's, uh, that, that's a sort of almost impossible question to think. You really have to take on board, is this idea worth bothering with, or should we forget it? When yeah. you, um, when you say um, the uh, baryonic matter is at 4%, you, presumably you're also including in that leptonic matter, are you? Oh yeah, well the leptons are the negligible compared to it. Well, well, it depends on how many neutrinos, I mean a neutrino oh, is well, not trivial. Well, there, 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 there is a the problem but, with neutrinos, um, uh, but um, I think all the well, things have this, certainly, the number of neutrino neutrino density put a limit on the number of neutrino species per possible. Yeah. So again, this is where not being an expert, complete expert in all this, one has to worry that there, you know there's some glaring anomaly here we haven't really thought about. But yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so would you um, say that that um, that that play between those dualities of the relationship of the space and the anti-space? Yeah that in a way that's somehow developing, it's enriching, and that that's being balanced by this dynamic um, development of, of, of dark matter in the universe. Well, it could be. I, 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 I really, I'm really stuck on the meaning of what, in what sense that is fundamental. I know Peter derived it based on all sorts of ideas that have nothing to do with that, you know, with... Uh, Max principle and inertia and the end of the paper. instantaneous gravity. All of that was done way before people were thinking about dark energy. But basically, either there's a set of ideas here, including general relativity and the expansion, the normal expansion of the universe described by Hubble. All of this stuff, all these other ideas are sitting there, and it's not clear to me if they fit easily together or there is an enormous tension which is going to push in one direction or the other. But, but something has changed, that, that the, the behaviour of the, the universe is no longer something static. Right. It's, it's something that's um, in some way developing. Yes. Yeah. 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 That, that's right. If, if you're making dark matter, um, then you've got to allow for that in the future. But what, what do you feel is, is what's changing? What's changing? Yeah, is, is something enriching because of the activity of the, that those play of those two spaces? Uh, very proper. I mean, basically, if you did expand space, then you would also expand your anti-space, so you would get more matter. Yeah. I mean, when you say dark matter, it doesn't have to be material. It might be as I say, inertial. 
in some way. And th that could be dynamics. So it's, it's what creates that mass. Mm. And it doesn't have to be, you know, material particles. It has to be... It has a gravitational field. It could be inertial, please. Well, of course it does. But how can you have a gravitational field without matter? You have to have energy. Any energy isn't, isn't matter. So it's something coming into the system. Yeah. It could be inertial energy. Yeah. So the universe is getting more energy. As well, it's not getting more energy. Mm. It's nil energy. It's, sorry? It's nil energy. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's getting more energy of one kind, negative energy of the other. So mm. it's a totally lesser, yeah. uh, zero. Yeah. But, so sorry. how does he know where to put the energy? How does it know how to do anything? I mean, it you is, say it's it, non-local. No, it knows because there's a prescription for it which he can't do anything about. No, it wouldn't be in one place, it would be distributed. So well, remember, you have to mind, mind the question, not me. It's not my presentation, <laughs> oh, yeah. it's his. Okay. <laughs> but how would you describe this new energy, that's, that's, um, or the change in energy? I mean, I think I've, my prescription for dark energy is inertial energy. No, not dark energy, dark matter. It's a f another form of inertial energy. I know dark energy, in my view, is in inertial energy. So I, th I also think it's another f could be another form of inertial energy, and it, a more localized one, because I mean, there are two ma ma major inertial forces. There's the centrifugal force and there's Coriolis force. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that, that these things are rotating, and rotation is connected with Coriolis force, and if a local, you, you can get local production due to Coriolis force of rotating systems. Mm. It may even cause a rotation. And any such rotating system will also have a rotation horizon. Mm. So if you have something that's rotating, if you go far enough out, it's light speed. So there's always a, there's always a boundary, which is why you take three-dimensional systems, which are non-commuting, do have things which are confined, and one-dimensional ones do not. It's yeah. because the fundamental nature of rotation has an edge, like the edge of a black hole. Mm. So, so what, what's changing is, is, as the speed increases, there's more of this... There's more, there's yeah. more, yeah, more inertial energy. Mm. It doesn't have to be physical matter. It doesn't have to be new particles or new no, it stuff. It confined, yeah. just it, as a flow. Right. Yeah. It, it's just energy of some sort, mm. yeah. and that will behave gravitationally like other energy does. So the dark mass and the dark energy there both behave as a mass. Yeah. Mm. Right. I'm just going to get set up. On, on a lighter note, you know, this business of they when you gave this talk 15 years ago or whatever, they, they laughed. It reminds, <laughs> me, it reminds me of Bob Monk. Yeah, that's I know what I'm going to say. Yeah. He says, when I was 18, I told them everybody I wanted to be a great comedian and they laughed at me. <laughs> <laughs> They're not laughing now. <laughs> that's a fantastic joke. <laughs> <laughs> what are those um, axes in that space? Oh, this one? Yeah. Well, this is, you have to, it's in Peter's book, but it, essentially, space is an abstract concept, and so we're living in a, in a space where the axes are a, 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 an abstract concept. And, and these are, and it's yeah, these are like the quaternions. These are the quaternion dual space to it, where essentially the axes are the other abstract quantities that you need to describe physics: mass, time, and charge. But the but the, the, the actual yeah, but there's different ways of doing yeah, this. Exactly. But it's like that monkey puzzle tree. Yeah. You, there are three things come out of every branch, so each branch produces another three. Like imagine that the middle one producing another three. But somehow they 
if, even though one is uh, doesn't preserve its rotation so much like the other, the same information is in each. Mm. And uh, you can do many things by using one space or using the other. The, and as I mentioned, parallel exclusion you can do. This is the key idea in, in, in your yeah. book, and you, you go to great lengths discussing it. Yeah. And I know in the. In yeah, if you look at three dimensionality, it yeah. comes in different forms, but yeah. it's all the same thing. So you don't have to name those axes, it could no, be no. anything that produces that power. It, it, could, it could be if it's not, it might not be uh, space, and, it might not be fundamental physics, it might be something else. Yeah. Like, for example, biology. Yeah, but anything with that three formness. Yeah, the, the, the this. double three formness. Yeah, it's a double space. The algebra is that of a double space. Now, as it happens in physics, that one of them is space itself, and the other one is everything else, which add up because you've got quaternion charge, you've got um, a mass which is a, a scalar, and you've got pseudo scalar or imaginary number which is time. And if you put an imaginary number with a quaternion, you get a space. You get the same as a space. Mm. Uh, and that's how it can be done. So that makes up another space, very similar to, in, in every respect to ours. Mm. But it's like, it's like a hidden one that you can never see, because the only thing you can ever directly measure is space. So it's like a kind of other that we... Uh, yeah, but your, your prediction that the structures in that other space do the job of supersymmetry That's and correct. you would not find supersymmetry turn out to be so far spot on. And they, and they have now been quoted in a... Well, there you are. So, as, as a serious possibility. And it's just that idea which, which lets, lets you think along these lines, I think. And you can actually do the calculations. You can do the renormalization calculations. Of making them into arithmetic, doing this. They're done in your book. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. just arithmetic when you do it. I think you've got it here. But, but, so you don't have to label those axes? No. But charge, mass, and... It's all in here. Yeah. This, this book. Um, I'm going to stick it up on the... Uh, yeah, on the possibly. Picture. Let me see if I can find where, where, where that is. I'm very mindful that perhaps we ought to be capturing this discussion in some form. Well, I think well, what obviously you're saying, it's captured on video, but I'm just, wondering actually if now's the time to be thinking about capturing it in print. Has anyone got a photo of that? Yeah, no, we need to get a photo of that. Historical photo. Don't put me in the frame. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Okay. Find this damn thing. I'm sure it's in here. Much more exciting. There's a list here. I'm trying PowerPoint. No, Is that your book, Peter? Yeah, there's a list here. Can we stick it up? You can yes, talk to if it. you can do. Yeah. Yep, good. But, but we've only got one minute now before. We start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Brilliant. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> a bit faint <laughs> on the page. Is, is this the anti-space? <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but the, the idea is basically, can you, if you look at the Dirac operator, they, it's got two particles and two antiparticles in it. Now, why on earth does it have two antiparticles? What the hell are they about? Well, really, they're in the other space. And so when people say, why is there more matter than antimatter? There isn't. Mm. It's just that that antimatter is in the other space. Because you, you never write direct wave function without having four particles in it, two of which are particles, two antiparticles. And because visualize got all buttons, it's pretty rubbish. It's not focusing. No, so you, they're I just don't think, it's focusing. It's over I don't think you're... No, you're that's, that's a bit faint, that diagram. So it's just a symmetry of two. It, it is for that, because it's just, it's just a symmetry of two. Yeah, it's the yeah. symmetry of two. One of which we observe because we're in it. Yeah. And the, and the crossover point comes with the zeta bevegon. Because that's what Schrodinger said. You get the salt, the 
fit the free particle solution for the for uh, the Dirac equation, and he found that that there was this extra term, which was a jittery switching between the the, the uh, particle and the antiparticle. Yeah, what's that called? Zitterbewegung. Oh, right. It's German meaning. Yeah. yeah. And we and we use the German term because we don't have any English words. Right. And it, it's. So it's coming into and out of existence. Yeah. yeah. It's going from what? Particle yeah. to antiparticle to particle yeah. to antiparticle, and the, the frequency is the Compton frequency, or related to the Compton frequency, which gives you the mass. Because the Compton frequency gives you the mass. And this is all in your book, Peter, is that right? Yeah. But yeah. okay. well, that's quite standard. This equation is quite standard. But well, this idea yeah. that we've got some spaces is not standard. What's the book type? It's. <laughs> I'll write it, write it down for you. Yeah. Okay. Foundations of physical law. Okay. Have you got a copy of it? It's just there. The t to buy it. I haven't got any no. to buy at the moment. Yeah. Just brought one from home. Um, but you can get you can get all the lectures on which that was based on the web. Mm. If you put my name in and F O P L, mm. you will get ten lectures come up, and there'll, there'll be the video. There'll be the script and there'll be the PowerPoint. Mm. So you can get it all on that. FOPL, Foundations right. of Physical Law. But it's still very happy to book. Oh, yeah. yeah but you can start off with that and then be tempted into buying the book. I've bought two copies because I lost the first one. Or I lent it to someone who can. We went into vacuum space. <laughs> How much are they, Peter? Oh, they, they're damned expensive because it's, it's uh, still scientific. Oh, yeah. So that's why I tell people to look up the lectures. This is like it's, it's more like 70, 80. 100 dollars. Yeah. Yeah. But I think there's paperbacks of it now. This was that out of the hardback. I think you might be able to get a paperback now. I'll tell you what you can have for free. I've got some copies of my popular book. Which later on I'll, I'll bring out some and you can kind of That's a good place to start. <laughs> you can have those for free. The right. yeah, How Schrodinger's Cat Escaped the Box. Right. But that, that's a popular book. Yeah. It's so not it's as. The not as it really is a It's the place, it's a good place to start. Sorry, the system shut down when I was trying to show you all the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's. Maybe that's telling you something. <laughs>